two viewership what's up this is the needed podcast episode five and today what we're going to do we actually got a great subject to talk about going to have great subjects to talk about pretty much from here on out in the season and that's what we saw over the weekend what we saw what we didn't see and that was uh the houston texans club series event which joe rice young wesley won it was tight. He had one great game, you know, but I thought he played very well. I thought, I mean, he executed pretty well. CJ played good defense in the championship game, but uh, congratulations to Joe because I know he puts a lot of time in the game, and I know he's one of the, one of the best young players that really needs a, a little more spotlight and a little more uh, attention, you know, going forward other than us just us man heads, you know, because obviously we know Joe Rice probably for the last, you know, two years or so, but – he needs to get a little more attention, a little more publicity in the mainstream Madden world. Hopefully, I can do that, and hopefully, uh, he can continue to keep playing well and continue to keep winning because he definitely put on a show that uh, definitely had me watching the game. I watched these games probably four times each. Once again, I just got to shout out Compton187 because he does – a simple job, but a job that, you know, is needed in the community, and, and we really appreciate him recording and uploading all these videos onto YouTube. I wish, once again, I wish this is something EA would do if they had a MCS page or a competitive Madden YouTube page somewhere where people would access the uh, these games and be able to watch them fairly easily, although... You know what, at this point, you know, let's just let Compton do his thing because Compton is holding it down and he deserves the bit of change he gets for putting up these games and giving us something to watch. I'm really a nerd that sometimes I'll go back and watch games from two years ago or I watch games from last year to Ultimate League. It's, it's always a reference to see kind of how some people play, what some people don't like and what they, what they do like. And I, like, I, like I said, appreciate Compton doing the easy job of recording these games reposting them, doesn't edit them or anything. You know, it's something easy that EA could do, but God bless Compton. So I was able to watch these games over and over and over. And, I mean, there's just a bunch of different things that I could talk about. I mean, last week we talked about the little – or la not last week, two weeks ago we talked about the Little Burke and T. Davis game probably for over an hour. So that's pretty wild. So that lets you know how long I can talk about one specific game. And, I mean – I have two games to talk about. I mean, the first game, shout out to my man, Bob. We all love you, Bob. You're the man. But, I mean, Troy Apke does not play for your team. He's not a receiver on your offense. It seemed like you were looking for Troy Apke just to, you know, just to give him the ball. Like, you wanted to give Troy Apke some love, and God damn, you gave him some love. And, and we <laughs> – you the guy, Bob. I mean, everybody has a game like that. I've been flooded on the live stage. I've been got my kick, teeth kicked in. It happens to everybody. And, you know, sometimes you just talk it up like I just had a bad day. Things really start snowballing. One of the biggest things, that a biggest skill that a man player has is to prevent the snowball. How do you prevent the snowball? Because it will start happening to everybody. It could happen. The snowball starts small, you know, and then every once in a while it, <laughs> It'll get going, and it happens really fast, man. And that's something I'm going to go over with Cassanta's game against Joe Rice is that he did not prevent the snowball. You know, and it's little things. Even when you get flooded, because I was talking to Cassanta in my chat maybe two days ago about the game, and he was talking like the game was close. That game wasn't close at all. I mean, Joe Rice pretty much did whatever the hell he wanted and went up and down the field. And that, that's pretty much the first game I want to get to. And it's kind of just what you can do better, you know, and that's what you got to even when you get flooded, even when you get blown out, you always got to think about what I can do better because that's all you can do. You never lose. You just learn and you have to take the learn. You have to take the good stuff from the bad. Now, obviously, Bob, I mean, Bob, God bless your heart, man. You went out like a champ. You were throwing that thing around, and, and God bless you. So I'm not – there's nothing really to watch in that game unless you want to see Troy Apke, the back of his jersey. But – um. I want to get into the Cassanta game because it's, I got notes for every game, and I really sat down. Like I said, I watched these games probably four times each, and it, it kind of reminds me of what I hate when I stream or when I watch games is that you guys have all the answers. It's easy as hell to sit here and watch these games and nitpick every little thing and just really, oh, this guy was open. You should have did this. You should have did that. Because that's what you guys do. That's what you guys do in the YouTube comments. That's what you do in the Twitch chat. You tell me how to play. And honestly, 
I'm going to tell these guys how to play because, you know, I have enough pedigree in this world to, you know, you guys can respect what I say. And, and I saw some things that I just were atrocious from Cassanta and some bad things from CJ as well. Joe Rice, I mean, honestly, he didn't do anything stupid. He always played like this. And this goes into knowing your opponent, man. Joe will, he will chew the clock like, so Wesley always want the game as short as possible. Like he always will. Chew. If he up seven with the ball, if it's tie game, he's chewing the clock. And that's something in playing the leaderboards. You kind of know that, you know, as soon as Wesley get like a little advantage on you, like a little like a one possession or, you know, the, the time running out in the first half, he's he's going to use the clock. And that didn't change. That didn't change at the club series, man. It's something. And and I mentioned this watching a 49er play yesterday is that you have to keep that same mentality pretty much in all your games. You know, if you, if your goal is to win the MCA, your goal is to win the Ultimate League or the Texans Club Series or this club series, this club, you know, you can't be playing Bazooka Joe from down the street and be labbing and throwing the ball up and, and, and being an asshole. You know, you, especially when you're in a tournament, when you're in group play, when you're in single elimination, even if you're blowing somebody out, man, you have to have that same mentality. And Wesley would have that mentality if he was playing a leaderboard game in the first week of the season when qualifying don't end for another two months. He's going to chew the clock and get out of the game with a W. And that's pretty much the mentality he always has. And that's pretty much how he played. And the first game I want to go into, if you can bring this up for me. What was Yeah, here we go. This is just Cassanta, who is Ganny, I think. I don't know how. I don't know what. I don't know what these names are, what they mean. Pretty much some things that, I mean, first of all, we will get into this game a little bit. Shout out to Cole and uh, Indy Kalu, former for, former Eagle great doing the uh, broadcast. I thought, you know, obviously I think Cole is tremendous at the play-by-play. You know, so they did a good job. I hope you guys enjoyed it. I hope you guys tune into all these games, man. Uh, and obviously, Wesley, since I want to say – let me pause since the first day of Mad 19 has been running 3 3 5, I'd flipped. It's something that I think Kiv flipped it. I mean, obviously, it won the first belt last year. I want to say, you know what frustrates me about Odd? I think it won every belt other than goals. Some version of the crossfire was won every single MCS tournament other than goals who ran 3 3 5 normal. So three out of the four were won by some version of crossfire. And for some reason, EA just said, you know what, let's just ignore that. We don't need to see what's wrong with that defense, see if it's easy to pick up, see if it works, see if it doesn't work. We're just going to ignore that and allow the same defense to work the next year. But anyway, you got to be prepared for uh, for 335 odd flipped. But another thing I'll let you know that Cassanta, man, he, he's not ready to play. And the first thing I wish I could, yep, right here. He lets the boo-boo scum kick fall into the ground. That shows, man, this, he's not even close. Like, he just allows it. And he has a fat guy there picking the ball up. So, one, that just shows, man, you you really not ready. Because later we're going to see CJ. We're going to see Joe Rice have somebody there, whether it be Gurley, whether it be, you know, a fast running back, somebody to catch the ball, or even a slow guy. They're positioning him the right way to catch the ball. I mean, just little stuff like that. So, now he's at the 12-yard line, rather than a 25, 30, 35, if he catches the ball the right way. But anyway, that's like super extra. Le- that's super like super duper. I mean, you got that's really being prepared. Something like that. I mean, special teams. I, although we ignored, and obviously there's no there's no special teams ebook or anything. There's definitely YouTube for it. But that's something. He, I mean, you definitely the the best players in the world are definitely um prepared for that scum kick down the sideline. It's something to the point where it's like, do you really want to keep running the same scum kick? Because if you obviously that's your fullback over there. So if you, I have Gurley there. So if you click on and move him over there, he catches the ball with a full head of steam, you can wind up at the 40. So the question is, do you still want to keep rolling out that same scum kick if people are prepared for it? Cassandra was not prepared for it. He's just out there willy-dilly, yeah, it's my live event, blah, blah, blah. Boom, now he's starting at the 12-yard line. So, But that's okay. I mean, the 12-yard line isn't the 2-yard line. It, it's far away, but nevertheless, he's still starting here. Now, 3 through 5 I flip, he's going to run the ball first play, which I do at pretty much every live event because, you know, the nuts are small a little bit <laughs> in the beginning of the game. I mean, you got all these lights on you. You're sitting here with it. You're going to run the ball the first down, and that's, that's perfectly fine. I mean, everybody does that. Please let me get some yards. That's how it goes. Now, we're pretty much 
Oh, where did I see he had? Oh, nah. So after the first of all, Cassata said, I remember he said in the chat the other day, if a couple things went differently, um, the game would have been closer. And a couple, and I'm assuming a couple things mean by the way he scores is he throws his crossing route. Where is it at? Three thirty-two. Yeah. All right. This is probably this play. Yep, it is this play. Now, this is something that I do that I don't know if any. This is where I said he had bad pocket presence. Because the 3 through 5 odds scares the hell out of you. It does. It always looks like it's going to scream at you. It always looks like it's going to come and get you. Now, here, now, this, obviously, he chose to try to get rid of the ball before the blitz got to him. But if he takes a small baby step to the left, if he sits in that pocket and just slides to the left and up a little bit, something that I would do. Now, I will honestly tell you that pocket presence is something that I I feel like I'm the best in the world at pocket presence, being in a pocket. And it's it's something where the game, it will take your game to the next level. Now, obviously, we all know this play, whatever play he's running, this little crossing route is going to be open. He has the drag. He has the, Somebody's going to be open. It's just a matter of if he's going to get screamed at or not. And as offensive player, you know that. Somebody's going to be open. Now, if he just steps a little bit, see the running back coming over, you see Lawrence Taylor is coming free, and you see everybody sees that. But if he just steps a little bit to the left here, man, is he going to have a big play. But instead, he just drifts straight back. He doesn't move at all. A little bit to the left, he even has a running lane. He can hit the drag, but he's he's leaving the crossing route open. The crossing route is could be a touchdown, really. <laughs> But he doesn't slide. He tries to get rid of the ball. Almost got lurked for the crib, honestly. But that's like super petty. It's super picky that um, because it's something that the best player, only the elite of the elite, is making that move to go ahead and slide to the left a little bit and let the running back pick up pick up 35 odd. Because obviously, if you played competitive man at all in the beginning of the year, you've played against this defense an immense amount. You should be. No one's comfortable playing against it, but you should be accustomed to being it to having to move in the pocket just a little bit. And this is, I believe this is the test. See, this time, and this is where you, I think you have Jonathan Jones and Deion Sanders, and he scores a touchdown on that play, which, I mean, it sucks that on defensively that Herman Moore ran through two people, but he ran through two people that simply can't tackle. I mean, as if you're Joe Rice, you're like, man, that sucks. But, I mean, you got two. One, you have Jonathan Jones, who's just awful, like just a silver player, I think. And then you have Deion, who obviously can't tackle, so. That's pretty much how it goes. Now, now we're gonna see Casanta. I think he throws his own little scum kick out here, and we'll see what what Joe Rice does against it. Because I honestly, I did not take down those exactly what he does. But see, he has girl. He moves him back, so he catches it kind of on the run. He got a bad animation, and boom! Now we're up here at the 32 yard line. So right there, the difference between Casanta and Joe Rice is 20 yards right off of special teams. Right off being prepared, he clicked on Gurley, moved him back, caught a running start of the ball. He didn't catch the ball to where – he didn't move Gurley to where he caught it and went out of bounds. He moved him all the way to the left, so he ran underneath it, caught it, kept running. So right there, right from special teams, that's a 20 yards difference. That shows you somebody that's prepared to play, that's playing against people that continually scum kick him, that has Gurley in the position to catch the ball right there. It's just just somebody more prepared to play the game than Cassandra. It, and it obviously it's something that the commentators will never talk about, and most people will never see that. But just right there, 20-yard difference from the beginning, boom. One person's more prepared. They have more reps in. They're ready to play. What was that? Here we go. With the, they're going to show the other play again. Uh, now the one thing I loved about Joe Rice is that he used these route combinate these route chems. Now what he got what he does here is he has Moss on the outside right. Let me get to the beginning of the play. He has Moss as the solo receiver. He has Beckham on the outside and Tim Brown in the middle. All these guys have some route chem. I'm not going to break down exactly what route chem they have because I mean it is what well, you guys can try to figure it out if you want, but. As you can see, hopefully he shows the play art again. But what he has here is he has Odell Beckham on a sharp corner route. Now, they nerfed bunch this year to where corner strike doesn't work because the corner route sucks, the C route sucks. But what he does is he uses these route chems, route chems like Odell Beckham right here to run a sharp corner route. So now he's doing a quick flood on the bunch side, something that's been removed from the game. But because of these route chems, Joe Rice has used them to bring it back. So he has, he has a sharp – corner route but you see Cassanta lurks underneath and actually takes this play away the first time it was good defense because he lurked the flat route 
and he played a cloud flat that covered a deep corner route, and the crossing route was bad too. So he played good defense on that down. But so he used Beckham on the left. Beckham on the left, and he used Moss on the right. I don't remember exactly what chemistries these guys are. You guys can try to figure it out if you want. But the main thing he used was the corner route to Beckham on the sh on the bunch side to get a, a quick flood over there, and he used this deep crossing route to Moss pretty much the whole tournament. This deep crossing route to Moss was pretty much his bread and butter. And what he also used here is I talked about this a lot two weeks ago with T. Davis was the mesh post with a hitch. Hopefully my man Wesley watched that video two weeks ago, incorporated this into his game, and is pretty much creating the same thing, creating the mesh post concept, but in the New England Patriots scheme. So by doing this, he has mesh post and he has buck sale he has base he has all the things in new england playbook but he also has the same mesh post concept so not only does he have beckham running a corner route he has beckham running a post route now and he'll hitch tim brown and he'll do the little running back wheel to Gurley here and the little out route to the solo receiver so he has pretty much anybody to throw to he chose to throw to the flat right there with shannon sharp and pick up a couple yards it really just it just was a great way to because when you're picking your bunch, you either pick West Coast or you pick New England. You either pick Pat Sale or you pick Mesh Post. And by using the route chems, what Joe Rice did, as you see right here, this is it. What Joe Rice did, he was able to – and we see a drop right there. He was able to incorporate Mesh Post along with Pat Sale. You know, it's just a great job of using what they put in the game. And they probably only had this in the game for, what, a couple weeks now? I want to say three weeks or a month. And he really used it and really came down to uh, being able to find out what chems worked the best and which way he was able to um, use them properly. You see Moss, Pat Sale just getting over. That wasn't a deep crossing route. That, in fact, was Pat Sale. And you see he pretty much primarily kept the bunch to this left side so he can go ahead and keep Moss on the right, the deep route runner, and then the elite one, ones on the left. But boom, boom, boom. Bang. So here, actually, this play is one where he hits Moss on his crossing route. And it's something that's a little bit deeper, pause, a little bit deeper than the, the Pat Sail. So you see the flood on the left side. He has the flat route, but he'll hit the deep crosser real quick right over the top. Randy Moss gets him inside there. Boom. Then he uses Todd Gurley, who I think is the best running back in the game. Go ahead and get him a touchdown. So now he ties the game up 7-7. We all have been in 7-7 games it's no big deal now Cassanta's going to get the ball back once again he's at the 20 did he do anything differently I think he was actually able to pause the game and put Barry Sanders at running back so right there boom so he did a little bit better he got he still got out of bounds but he caught it 22 yard line is not bad so he definitely learned Ricky might be better than Gurley but I'm taking Gurley because I don't I'm not level 60 on Mutt I will never be a level 60 in Mutt shout out to y'all that are level 60 in Mutt it will never be me I don't know how to get level 60. I, I feel like I played the game enough to get level 60, but I'm not level 60, so I will never have a full Ricky. Maybe, like, towards Easter, I might have a full Ricky. By then, there's going to be, like, another level of Ricky, and we'll go to level 80. Then I'll be stuck at level 60, then a level 80. Then I'll, I, I'll, I'll just never be a Mutt Master. I've conceded the Mutt Master to you guys, man. Salute the Mutt Masters. But so on and so forth, <laughs> Cassandra gets the ball back. Now, where's my mark where he's going to just have another shitty pocket press? Oh, so on and so forth. He runs a little quarterback sneak in the middle. Ain't nothing wrong with that. Now, I think he gets super screamed at one of these possessions. Another inside zone. That's what you got to do, man. You got to hope the bust it. You don't want to continue to pass against this. It's not a big deal. But this is kind of where I feel like, feel like the nerves really got to him, like, because you'll notice a couple – I'll notice a couple things that he did that obviously I wasn't a big fan of. And this one, I think he gets screamed at. I think he could have had better pocket on this play. But it was, it was kind of – it wasn't as bad as the first one. He slid to the left. He went right to J.J. Watt. Right to him or Bosa, whoever that is. He, you have to see this as a man player. Like, obviously, like, sometimes this shit happens and it's like, bro, like <laughs> – you're 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 SOL if this sometimes this happens. But on to me, I'm at least attempting to slide to the left. 
Like, and if he gets me, he gets me. That's just how the game goes. That's just how, I mean, you get screwed. And this is why you run 3 through 5 I to get these fluky screams. But both of these guys are trying to block this guy, and we just drift back into the right. You didn't give these guys a chance. Now, obviously, it's a stupid-ass play. It shouldn't. He shouldn't get screamed at at this level. I mean, I don't know where the nano detection was on this. But right there, see, when I catch the ball and I drop back, I'm like, oh, shit. Somebody's coming right through my right B gap. I have to go to the left. You can't go straight backwards. You just, you simply cannot go straight back. Give them no chance. Boom, and we're sacked. Now the now the drive's over. Now your drive is cooked because you, what are you at? You're at third and twenty-two. I'm just saying. I'm not. That play wasn't as bad as the first one. That play it was damn near unavoidable. But you could have made an attempt. That's my only point. Could have made an attempt. And I will show you what happens the next play. He does a good job here on third and 21. And this is why I tell people all the time, man, that when you get to third and 21, you get to, you know, second and 21, you, you're not going to get 21 yards on one play. Nobody has a 21-yard play. And Cassandra also looked like he has some type of route come. He does this. But you can try to get try to get some yards back, and that's what he does here, which is very good. Get half of the yards back. Good tackle. And he no huddles. Now, the no huddles. I, the, the no huddle drives me crazy because if you don't know how to the whole game, why do people know huddle on third down? I don't understand. It's not like he's going to change his defense. Now, what he does here, he's in such a hurry that he do, he keeps the delay route on Leonard Fournette. Now, what happened, because he does not max protect, he doesn't want to do another hot route. And I say this about the no huddle is that it rushes you. Not only does it rush your opponent, which is cool because I'm happy as hell that I got you on 4th and 13 and you're no huddling. Because to me, defensively, I feel like you're no huddling, you're rushing your own mind. You know, the no huddle gets you panicking, gets you not thinking straight, and it really gets you rushing like you're – it's an emergency. Obviously, it's an emergency. It is a rough spot. 4th and 13 is rough. I mean, it's the game of his life right now, you know, but when you no huddle, you just speed up your thoughts. And what he does is he forgets to go ahead and – he blocks Barry Sanders, so that's his – I don't know if he has conductor or not. I don't know. But he has all these wild routes. So he obviously blocked Barry Sanders. He puts Herman Moore on this other route. He puts Moss on this other route. But he does all this, and he forgets to block Fournette. He leaves Fournette on the delay route. Now, the delay route – the delay route sucks. Delay, if we remember back in Madden – actually, this is just Pat Sale. Boom, there it is. It's just past sale. So he blocked Barry Sanders because he didn't max protect unless max protect keeps the delay route. I don't really know. I don't really have that many delay route plays where I – but this is my point. So he blocked Barry Sanders. He hitches Beckham. He puts more on this. So obviously it's not a quick snap because he had to uh, – unless he max protect, it keeps the delay route, hitch, and then cross the route to more. First of all, there's no fade – there's no streak to run all these damn zones off. And honestly, at this point, you'd rather have more just on a streak and then deal with the playmaker to Beckham. But my point is that he leaves Fournette on his delay route. This delay route is not going to help you do shit unless he completely uh, – you want Fournette blocking. And what happens is Fournette leaves. Now, I don't know if he – come because what happens is he gets screamed off this right edge. Because, you know, Joe Rice, like any smart player, 4th and 13, you're getting it. You're, I'm sending the crib. So he sent, he sends all his people. And this guy comes off the edge. And where's our, where's our guy for that? And Cassandra throws it out of bounds. And then people laugh. Oh, throw it out of bounds. It's just second nature when you're going to scream that, throw the, ball, throw the ball away. I'm not mad at that. But I, I, I don't know. I don't know the science. I'm not the super lab rat. I don't know what Fournette would have did if he was just straight blocked instead of a delay route. But him running out into the flat, damn sure ain't helping us get this. <laughs> damn sure ain't helping us get fourth and thirteen. So that's pretty much what I think. Like when you know huddle, you just forget about things. You're not. You're not. You're not thinking at your all time high level because you're rushing. You you put you add a sense of urgency that's already there. So the sense of urgency you have being fourth and thirteen, now you multiply that by no huddling and making this a big deal. So obviously he got stopped right there. So the max protect does it turn the delay route into a blocking route? I'm I, I would assume that it does. I'm not sure, but if not, he did three hot routes there with no streak and no nothing. And 
it just a lot of people do that. And and I prepare when I play, I always prepare for a third down stop for people to no huddles a fourth down. And it, it's getting and I don't understand it. I don't understand why you why the need to no huddle when you haven't no huddled the whole game right there. But but so on and so forth. Like I said, the delay route maybe would have came over and blocked that guy and gave him a little more time. But I think him no huddling right there was just just made him think too fast. And he, he forgot to do that. Fourth down, turns the ball over to Joe Rice, who pretty much goes on the field, does whatever he wants, blah, blah, blah. He goes, he goes down here and score. I'm not going to break down any more of his plays because, God bless, I mean, he might have to continue to play. I'm not going to put all his scheme out there, although he did hit that crossing route to Moss a lot. There you'll see Moss. If Moss isn't on your team, you're already asleep because you need somebody to do stuff like that. Shout out to Niner. So, 14 nothing. Where we're at right here, 11 minutes. Oh, we already went over to hurry up, 12.44. Another bad pocket. I thought, obviously, I'm very particular in my pocket. No, again, a no streak on the field. He gets kind of the glitch. And this is why I say max protecting is, is, I swear to God, max protecting is the worst thing you can do in this game. I don't know why we don't have a, f a fade somewhere. Like, what happened? I don't know. But this is just why contains are fucking dumb because they both went with him. Now, obviously, when this happens, you really can't avoid this. But you damn sure can get sacked up here at at the 15-yard line instead of the 5-yard line. <laughs> you know, like, because second and 22 and second and 14 are a little bit different. But that's just that's just unfortunate type of shit. And honestly, I feel like... I feel like uh, you always need a fade on the field. So second and 22 happens. I forget exactly. I don't know if he does a pick, but he does not score. Drops that right there. Punts the ball. He actually get, he actually has a shitty punt, but I'm going to show this because I just want to laugh. I want to laugh at how bad this game is because I do watch this because a punt right here is a big deal because uh, he doesn't catch it. And Deion Sanders, who le le – Deion Sanders probably ball skills-wise and coordination-wise is probably one of the best athletes in the history of athletics. And he just – I mean, this – can someone explain – he, like, gets shot while he's running and <laughs> he can't keep going. He just falls on the ground. Ugh. Like, like, come on, man. And honestly, that is huge because no matter where you're on the field, if Deion Sanders has the ball in his hand, it has potential to go to the crib, especially against his special team unit where obviously there's not 90-speed people and stuff like that. So the fact he didn't catch that on the sideline or he didn't pick it up in motion just cost Wesley, I mean, tons of yards, honestly. But the game is just bad for that. But anyway, so on and so forth. Anyway, it doesn't matter because Wesley goes right down. Well, blah, 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 blah. He, and he starts chewing clock like I told you. He hit, once he gets, once he gets you, on, once he gets a little advantage, bang! I'm up, I'm up seven. I get the ball at half, and 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 I got the ball in field goal range pretty much. He's going to chew clock. He's going to take the game. He's going to shorten the game. He's going to make you panic. And this all goes back to that sense of urgency. No huddling on third down. Now the chewing clock, the situation in the game makes Casanta just. More and more and more sense of urgency, really rush things, really, you know, not think that straight. And I'm going to go ahead and show you guys something I thought he did. That was probably the worst thing he did all, all day. But anyway, so on and so forth, I believe Joe Rice scores fairly easily. Although he throws the ball back to Moss, wait for it. Now there is where I called my timeout, right there. If I'm, if I'm Cassandra, I call timeout right there. Because the clock is running. Who knows what – you already know Joe Rice is going to take this thing down under five seconds. I call my timeout because he can't really get another first down without scoring a touchdown. And if he's going to milk the whole clock, I'm still going to get 30 seconds and the ball with no timeouts. So what I do right there is I call timeout. He waits and lets him run another 30 seconds, which is okay because some people – I mean, this is either – I mean – this is picky, kind of, but I would have called timeout right away because who knows what happens. He could score in the next play. I want as many as much time left. Now I'm down. If I'm concerned, I'm down. I'm down seven. I'm pretty much down ten, and I'm kicking the ball off. I need this game to be as long as possible. So the more, as long as I can keep as much time on that clock as I can, that's what I'm going to try to do. Blah, blah, blah. Eventually, he scores a touchdown. 
So 21 to, 21 to 7. Angel Rice gets the ball at half. Cassante needs points here. Obviously, he needs points. He needs a touchdown would be great to keep it a, a one-score game. But he needs a field goal. And I'm going to tell you guys why he needs a field goal so importantly. He needs any type of points really changes this game, really, really, really changes everything that happens pretty much going forward in the second half of the game. Here he goes with the motion block. See, a lot of people do this, and he catches them sleeping with the Barry Sanders. Good job diving and tackling with Brian Dawes because that looked like a touchdown all the way. So now you got your field goal. Chat, chat YouTube. Everything, you have your field goal. It is 21 to 10 at halftime if nothing else good happens for you. You cannot not get this field goal. Now, obviously, you're getting you, – shit is looking bad for you. In your mind, you're saying shit is looking bad for me. But your goal in a game when you're losing is just stay alive. And not getting this field goal is killing yourself, really. And so, so what happened? Then he throws it. He gets out of bounds. He has one timeout. The clock is running. He ought, Obviously, you guys, and this is why some people give up on the whole running back at tight end thing in New England playbook because you have to come out in this formation that, for some reason, none of you guys have dots out of. U-Trips has enough dots to where you can come and run up play and try to get something, and if you don't get it, boom. Then you can call your timeout, so on and so forth. But with 26 seconds, listen. So you're so accustomed to coming out in his U trips, audible into trips tight end, so I can get Barry Sanders at, at tight end. This is a point in the game, if you're not going to call your timeout, you're going to continue to let the clock run, that you have to go ahead and just come out in trips tight end. Even if you don't have Barry Sanders at tight end, you have to run a play. You have to get as many plays in as possible down here. And if you're going to take the time to audible from U trips to, to trips tight end, that's going to take 8, 10 seconds off the clock. You know, so here we go, 25, 24, 23, 22. I'm still going to come out in the same thing. I'm on an audible, 20 seconds, 19, 18. So now we're getting down to where we only have one play. 14, it just just runs anything because he realizes he's running out of time. Chucks it right at his user. So that could have been a pick right here. So now you have t 10 seconds. 10 seconds, one timeout from the 15-yard line. Now, your mind, you, you, you obviously you want, you want to get back in the game with a touchdown. You want to. You really do. Like, you really want to get back in the game with a touchdown. But you need, you need in the back of your mind, you have to know, I need this field goal. And I'm going to show you the most atrocious play I've ever – like, I, honestly, I don't have nothing for this. My, everybody's same – we all had the same play for this. Put Randy Moss or Herman Moore or somebody and just throw that bitch high and hope they catch it. But I'm going to show you the most atrocious play I have ever seen called at a live event. Because you need the field goal here. At worst case scenario, it's 12 to 10. This is the worst play I have ever seen at a live event. I will tell you this right now. I just want to see the play art. So you have a drag. You're not going to throw the drag. It's not because what the fuck is the point of throwing the drag? So you have this crossing route to Herman Moore, and you have this up, this 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 shit route that's a out and up, and they're running to the same exact spot. So if I'm Joe Rice, you know what I – oh, all I got to fucking do is cover the middle of the field? Oh, wow, you made my life easy. If I'm on defense, I'm worried about a wheel route. I'm worried about a fade, high ball to the outside. I'm worried that you're motioning a fade to go to the outside right. I'm just – I'm worried about a bunch of stuff. But instead, this is the play that gets called. Both of these people in the same – the same spot? This, literally, he covered both people. He didn't need any other defenders on the field. He could have had one man on defense and covered that shit play and appointed a game where you needed any type of points. Because, and I'll tell you, obviously it would have sucked settling for three there. It always sucks settling for three, but you have to settle for three. You have to. And kicking the ball off and throwing that play right there, bro, you – like, you, you might as well get up out of the seat and walk off the stage for putting that dog shit play on the field. And so on and so bang. Now, now the game's cooked. Because, one, you haven't played an ounce of defense. And, and, two, now you're down two scores. 
Obviously, you would have still been down two scores with the with 21 to 10. But what happens is because Joe Rice is up 14 points instead of being up. Oh, we're going to show this again. Jesus. So now Joe Rice gets the ball the second half. And because it's 21 to 7, you know what Joe Rice says? You know what? All I got to do is go down here and get a field goal and the game is over. That's all, that's all I got to do. I got to go down here, get a field goal, and the game is over. So that's what he does, and in Joe Rice fashion, he's going to chew the clock. Boom, boom, boom. Todd Gurley chewing the clock. He's in field goal range. And, you know, if I'm Joe Rice, and this is how I say it, this game is over. This game is stick or fork in it. This game is cut. But if it was 21 to 10, Cassandra would still have a little bit of life because the field goal would only bring it back to a two-score game. Now a field goal is going to end the game. Joe Rice is over here chilling. Like, yeah, I'm going to get my field He might. And, and honestly – if I'm, I'm running every play, and I think he actually does, just run base. Take another 30 seconds off the clock, just run base. And that, that's pretty much by not getting your field goal, it allowed Joe Rice to play this goddamn comfortable that he ran base on third and two. That, how comfortable is that? We all want to be this comfortable in, in a Madden game to be able to, oh, now I'm up 17 points. If Cassandra was shitty when he was only down seven or he was down 14, he's damn sure going to be shitty when he's down 17 points. And so on and so forth, bang. I don't even know if there's anything else I really want to show you guys in this in this game. Just that 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 terrible play, pretty much that terrible play to end the half. Now, obviously, I thought his pocket presence could have been better, but that's really nitpicking because it's something I'm very good at and it's not necessarily something I expect everybody else to be good at. But that play before half was absolutely devastating in his chances to win this game, especially when you're playing up against somebody that's that's better than you. You have to know, damn, this person is better than me. <laughs> and that's okay because, you know, there's people that are really, really good at Madden, and you have to play accordingly. Or this person's a really good offensive player. I have to play accordingly. I have to shorten the game. I have to stay alive. And by not getting that field goal, he didn't stay alive. Because you got you to gotta assume more often than not, when you're playing somebody that's good, you're going to give up a field goal on their offensive drive. Pretty much every time. You're going to give up a field goal. I'm not I'm not the steel curtain. Nobody's the steel curtain right now. And if you have to go in thinking you're going to have a field goal. So that's why he should have definitely got away with that three before half. That ended the game, in my opinion, seriously. I mean, the game was – the game wasn't – I mean, the game – this game shouldn't have been close. A lot of problem I have I see with a lot of people running this trip tight end. Obviously, it's a great offense. Probably, honestly, I would say it's probably the best offense in Madden for for anybody to run. There's no, there's nothing short, dude. Everything is I want to throw this crossing route. And I tell you guys, on all these defensive ebooks, defensive guides I put out, everybody just wants to throw this crossing route. And that that definitely ended the game. And this is something. <laughs> I fumbled. That's why I lost. That's some shit they they tell you. You ever you ever not see the game? You ever see not see a game and ask your homie, like, what happened? Oh, I fumbled, man. They got me. I was going to score. It would have changed the whole game if I get a score right there. That's the shit they talk about right there. Man, they, I got strip fumble. I got screamed at. Blah, blah, blah. That is what they talk about. So when your homie tells you they fumbled, this is this is what happened right here. Boom. But anyway, seriously, uh, Cassandra really just uh, – he lost the game, but it was definitely some things he could have did better. And that before the play, before the half play, it was just that was bad. But so Wesley was going on to win this game. I talked about his route comment, his route cams that he used. Uh, yeah, that's all I want to talk about in that game. I'm not going to talk anymore about Joe Rice's offense because you, I don't want to give you guys any more help. But you can watch these games, and this is what those drives be crazy though with people like. Once your game is on film, shout out to Compton 187 again. Once your game is on film, anybody that's going to use that to beat you already has it. You know, they're already going to break all the stuff down that I already did. That that I I, I mean, I I have his, the plays that he ran in my mind to a T. You know, and I think anybody that's, that's on my level of man will already have that from watching this game. So I could talk about it, but I'm not going to help anybody else that has to play him. So this game is cooked. This game's over. So, like I said, we're not going to talk about Bob. We're going to go ahead and talk about CJ versus Joe Rice. This was a great one. Honestly, this is – what did we watch? The the Arizona Club Series and we watched um, – that's all we watched. So, this was probably the best game so far. 
I think this game has a lot we can take to. Two good players that really uh, put on a good show for us, really. And we can start by the kick. Once again, Joe Rice wins the kickoff. And what and what do we have here? CJ. Let's do it again. What's CJ do on the first kick? Clicks on his fullback, moves him back, catches the ball in stride. Instead of being on a 12-yard line, he's on the 31-yard line. Boom. 19-yard difference from Cassanta. So, so on and so So this was a good game. CJ played Bob, who we talked about Bob. Rest in peace to Bob. I mean, my guy, brother. <laughs> Great Fortnite player, good man player, had a bad game. Not going to show it anymore. But that's the first thing on my notes. The first thing on my notes is CJ was prepared to catch the kickoff. You know, and that, that shows you, okay, he's ready to play. You know, he's got a lot of reps in. He knows what the – and another advantage that we, CJ has here that not a lot of people talk about, but CJ played first. CJ played his game first. CJ won his game. CJ won his game fairly easily. CJ's been relaxed for an hour and a half now. And what was CJ doing the whole hour and a half? He was sitting there watching Joe Rice play. He watched Joe Rice. He watched every little route combination he made. He's prepared for this deep crossing route to Moss. He's prepared for a corner route. He's prepared for this post and this wheel route to Tim Brown. He's prepared for everything that he just watched in an hour and a half. So the best place to be and as a man player is to win the first game easily and have an hour to go ahead and watch your opponent play the whole game. And that's what he did. He sat and watched. So he was definitely prepared for the scum kick. And it's definitely uh, something that you got to utilize your time there. You got to utilize every every bit of information they give you. You know, if there's information out there for you guys to use, you should use it. And that's something CJ did. I, I hope he did well. You know, I'm going to tell you that it, it worked out all the way for him. But I believe on his first drive, let me see. Boom, 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 boom. It's definitely some wild plays that CJ draws up, though, for especially for short yardage. Because he'll go down here and he'll get a fourth down. I believe he gets an early fourth down. This play. Look, keep showing me this play. What? I think he does something even worse. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Once he took the bus. <laughs> what? What ebook is this in? A fade, a fade, a zig, a drag, a wheel. What? Like, third and three. Middle of the field. He's not in the red zone. He's not. He's all. He is whatever you want. As soon as he put Beckham on a fade. Like, and, and this is the one thing that's crazy to me. Now, obviously, sometimes the lone receiver, Beckham, like, they'll put a cloud out here and they won't leave a deep blue. But that's something you kind of gauge throughout the game. This is the first 42 seconds into the game. You don't know what the hell he's, what his tendencies are on defense, especially against Bunch. You just saw him play against Cassanta's shitty offense, and he didn't have to play Bunch defense like that. So, for me, it's like, what is, like, what are your options here? Obviously, you have a zig. If you're not blocking anybody, first of all, you're not. You're sliding left. God bless your heart, because I, I sliding left is probably the last thing I would want to do against three three five odd. Because you want this right guard to stay where the hell he's at. Maybe sliding left is the glitch. I'm gonna see if it might. I, I need help. But this is my point. You're not blocking anybody, so you have to prepare to super get screamed at. So my point is here, there's a three rack somewhere, there's a yellow zone somewhere. Your only quick read, you have a, you have a, <laughs> this is wild to me. You have a drag and you have a zig. They're both going to be in the same area for long. If you're getting screamed at, you're not going to be able to throw to anybody because he's going to be lurking in the middle here somewhere. This wheel route, the hard flat, take that away. If he has deep blues, you're shit out of luck. Now let's see what, oh, he ID'd the mic on the left side. Okay, he might be, oh, he motioned out the drag. Lurks underneath, and he gets screamed at, and he and there's just nowhere to throw the ball. Like, like what? I, th that play was horrific. Honestly, that play so bad. You, bro, 
I don't know what defense this gets open on. Seriously, like what what defense would this play work on? Because there's nothing in the intermediate area. There's just two streaks and a bunch of short shit. And he gets screamed at. But anyway, so anyway, he gets to the fourth down. He gets the fourth down. This was a nice little dot on the fourth down. He ran a uh, trips tight end. I think they just showed it. He already got it. Trips tight end. He threw over the middle. Boom. All right, go fourth down. Once again, this was just aggressive. This is probably what I would do if I was lurking. Just go take that drag away, and he threw over the top. Nice read. Nice first down. But then he goes ahead. He gets sacked, I believe, or he lose yards. Second and 14. Down underneath the Franco Harris. Something that he used Franco Harris at tight end was really good because he can spin, he can truck, he can make plays. Definitely a weapon at the tight end position that he didn't have to audible to get to. Probably a lot of cap. Here we go with the verticals. The verticals, we got it. We got those verticals in the trash against 3 through 5 odd. I felt like verticals was good against DB Fire. And I feel like now if you run this verticals, the only thing that can be open is really the wheel route. And if Joe Rice puts a cloud out there, covers the wheel route, and he high balls, which was the right read, the only thing he had to go to, drops it. Now, he has a four from three. This is a tough call. I'm not going to argue one way or the other where to go for this way to kick. I'm cool with kicking it. I probably would kick it. It's a big game. You want to get some points on the board. No matter what the lead is, you feel good with the lead. There's nothing wrong with having a lead in a game of Madden. That, that's simple and plain. So I'm, and that's not questionable. I'm definitely cool with kicking that field goal. And here we go. Joe Rice goes down. Same offense he's been running pretty much all day. But he throws it in. I believe this might be the play where he throws a book. Maybe not. No, nah, because he was using him more. He picked him with more. Throws in a flat. Get over here. Shannon Sharp. That's another weapon. You see him getting nine yards on a flat route, man. You got to have the more weapons you have on the field, the better off you can be. But anyway, so he gets the lead. And he get he gets a pick right here. I believe this is the play where he gets a pick. He tries to throw the Moss. They're all kind of in the same area. Dollar, people said that the dollar dead, man. I really don't think dollar's dead. I just think, um, ooh, right there. Who's that? Ed Reed? Jeez, he played that. That's the difference between mesh post and that little route that he runs or whatever. I think that might have been a deep crosser. Not quite as quick as mesh post. You can't really throw it that fast. And third and two, I believe this is. And he goes in a nickel over G scheme. This is where he picks him off. Boom. So CJ got his three-point lead, and he got a pick. You're playing a guy that you just watched for an hour and not get stopped. You know, he didn't get stopped in the last game you watched. So this is what you have to well, you have to go in the game. You caught a pick on him. This guy, Joe Rice, just fried the last guy he played. His offense looked really good. So you have to say, I'm playing an offensive player. He's going to continue to score. I need to put up as much many points as possible here in the first half. So CJ goes back down the field pretty well. Oh, no, this is the pick. Boom, so CJ goes right back down the field. So here we go. We're in a little ace post. He's chewing the clock. He's using the time. He knows he has an advantage on Joe Rice. He knows if he scores a t nice read, throwing underneath, take your flat. Good read. Boom. He knows if he scores a touchdown here, he's got Wesley's back up against the wall, and he's sitting in great position. And that's exactly what I would be thinking, too. I'm, me on this drive, man, I would be so concerned with getting a touchdown. I would, I, it would, I know it would change the game. And he's using Leonard Fournette. That's why you brought Leonard Fournette to the party. That's why, I mean, you continue to um, give him the ball. This is the exact position where you would like to give him the ball. So he goes a little bunch flipped here. Boom. Let's, what else are we doing? Blah, blah, blah. It gets inside the five. And that's, bro, Fournette. For, for me, we're taking this under 30. I'm running again, a guaranteed run to take this to the second quarter. I don't want Joe Rice offense on the field. I don't want to see the bunch. I don't want to see anything like that. I just want to go ahead and keep pounding the ball. Let's see what happened. Did he take it to the two? Oh, he did. He took it to the second quarter. Exactly what I would have done. But now this is the this is this is the biggest play in the series, is right here. And I say this a lot. You win inside the 10 on first and second and down. If you get a third and goal on the six, third and goal on the seven, third and goal on the eight, that's what I call third and field goal because you're going to kick it. So this play from the six-yard line, you'd like to get half of this. You'd like to get positive yards so you can get to a point where you quite possibly could run it in again because you, 
The hardest thing to do in the red zone is score in a must-pass down. It's already hard enough to score in the red zone when your opponent doesn't know if you're running or passing. But if you get to the point inside the 10 where they know you have to pass, God bless. I mean, like I said, we talked about that in Cassandra game. We pretty much just throw the ball high. Last year, we at least had the low ball dots all over the field to throw those. But when your opponent knows you have to pass and you're inside the 10-yard line, it's tough as hell. And so that's why I say inside the 10 is one on first and second down. Obviously, first down, he lost the yard. Second down, he's going to go ahead and run. And what happens, he gets blown up. Boom. So now you're, you're a field goal. Third and goal from the nine is field goal territory. And when he started his drive, he said a touchdown puts me up two scores. I need a touchdown, I need a touchdown, I need a touchdown. But just because you need a touchdown doesn't mean you have to force anything. And obviously 10 nothing is great. It's way better than 3 nothing. But 6 nothing is better than 3 nothing. 6 nothing is a big deal. And what happens is here, he just, he just throws a bad pass. He throws a pick. And it's it's something that obviously he chew clocked again. He's really shortening the game. Now, to me, if you're going to shorten the game, and that's that's fine, that's great. If you're going to shorten the game, you don't throw a pick down here. You don't throw late off your back foot, back across the body. You don't throw a pick here, especially when you have when you do have Beckham coming back across the middle around the end for a high ball for a touchdown. Now, if you run this play, why is Beckham not the person you're throwing the ball to? Obviously, you want to hit this C route. Joe Rice knows this. He runs New England Bunch. He's been around for three, four years. He knows you want to hit this C route. He takes his user all the way out to play. But instead of hitting Beckham, which honestly, if you call pass sale right now, if you call this play, that is honestly, you want to throw this C route over here. To, I don't know who this is, Tyreek Hill, whoever it may be. You want to hit him, but at the same time, Beckham is your Beckham is your bailout. Honestly, Beckham is your bailout, and when you don't hit Beckham, you decide to throw to this guy, who honestly isn't going to get the isn't gonna, even if he catches it, he's not going to get this first down anyway. He's he's going to kick a field goal anyway, and he gets picked off. Luckily, it wasn't a pick six because that would have been devastating. But obviously, it's a throw he wants back. It's a play he wants back. It's a play right there. That could have decided the Texans club champion. But now he's got to fight. You know, he's not done. He's still up 3 nothing. He still has to fight. And what happens here is Joe Rice dot, 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 dot. He goes down, I believe. He's 2 for 5 with a touchdown. They're showing the pick again unless I – yep. Okay. So, Joe Rice has the ball. Joe Rice is going to dot, dot, dot. And he gets – he actually – he gets inside the – um. Inside field goal range, and what CJ did that Cassante didn't do, every time Joe Rice was in this little set that he runs, he blitzed the shit out of him, and it really caused um, and talk caused him getting sacked. See now, if I'm CJ, I call timeout right there. Boom. But that's neither here nor there. Anyway, he gets him to third and eight, and he screams at him again on his under center thing. So he forces Joe Rice into a field goal. Boom. That's okay. Now we're back. Now, obviously, he would love to have his three. He just gave back on the other end. But it's three to three. Huge play. So, this kickoff. Now, obviously, I don't know how he kicks this ball. No, he does scum kick it. No, he doesn't. Now, hold on now. Now, I don't know if he forgot. Now, this is goes goes all the way back to Cassanta being bad. Because I want to say because Joe, because CJ... Caught the first kick with so much momentum with Franco Harris. And because Joe Rice not stupid, Wesley knows, damn, I can't give him the ball on the 40-yard line. You know, because one dot, he's back in field goal range. He decides to kick it deep because CJ is prepared for the scum kick, because CJ has a great player catching the, catching the scum kick, because of the time and the situation, he decides to kick deep so he doesn't give him great field position. Because CJ is prepared for the scum kick, he has the right person on the field. So... Joe Rice says, you know what, I'm going to kick it deep to prevent him from having great field position, and what happens? Boom. Deion Sanders take it take it to the Baja. Well, not really because number 31 for some reason sucks, and Todd Gurley is you – no, know, if you don't have Todd Gurley on your team, and you get Todd Gurley on your team, and CJ's happy, ha, 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 ha. Okay. So now this is another thing. 
obviously I'm happy as shit. I just got a free field goal. Like I'm like, like doing that little laugh CJ just did. That's what I'm doing. <laughs> I'm doing the same thing, you know, because I got a free field goal. Anybody wants free points. A free field goal is a great. Oh shit. Oh shit. Where am I? Oh yeah, we're back. Okay. Now, the first play out of here, he runs. Now you have 35 seconds and no timeouts. Tough spot to score regardless, even with timeouts, even in the It's a tough spot to score because you're so close to the end zone, but you run the first play. So this is going to take half of your time away because you decided to run the first play. Now, running the first play, it was 35 seconds. Now we're already down to 25 seconds. Now we're at 20 seconds. You know, now 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 it's pretty much you're kicking a field goal no matter what because you chose. Now you're doing 15 hot routes. Yeah, now now this is your last play because you chose to run and the clock was running. You have nowhere to go. Scramble outside with McNabb. Just get rid of the ball. And so that goes down to do I do I really want? I mean, is the run the best call? 35 seconds left, no timeouts. The run calling the run right there pretty much just ensure the fact you're going to get a field goal, and that's cool. I'm not. Super against that because it is hard to score down there. You don't want to force anything. You want to get away with your with your field goal that, that God gave you or the fact you were prepared for special teams gave you. And it, and it just shows a lot, man. Every little part matters. Deion Sanders just gave him three points. So now it's 6-3. to three. Obviously, 9-3 to three would have been a much better situation for CJ. But he still has the lead. We talked about it. He still has the lead. He's still – Regardless of what happens, he's still in control. Not in control, but he still has the upper hand. And you'll always take that in a game of Madden. Todd Gurley. Todd Gurley, Todd Gurley. Best running back in the NFL right now. I think he's the best running back in Madden for those us peasants that can't get mutt level 60 for Ricky Williams. But, uh, okay. So, boom. 6-3. to three. Second half is going to start. Second half starts with a bang because the first play out of the second half, Joe Rice goes back to this deep crosser here to Randy Moss. Come on, let's go. Let's get – he goes to the crossing route over here to Randy Moss, hits that, and user gets juked out, and Randy Moss is just – must be on everybody's team. Takes it to the crib. Huge play. Now, we didn't get our three earlier, so now we're down four points. Great play for Wesley, who, who I mean, I don't think he played. He do that one pick, but he was in a battle. And to get a big play like that is very relaxing. CJ was playing good defense, making him work. And to get a one-play touchdown just is a big deal, obviously. Anybody wants a one-play touchdown, and he got it right there. So CJ's going to get the ball back. CJ's going to go down the field. And there's a couple plays that I really just hate. CJ, boom, uh, he's he's doing good when he looks for when he puts intermediate routes on the field. He's doing fine. It's when he tries to get too cute. Second and two here. This is this is probably one of the biggest things in the game. Biggest drives in the game. Goes high ball to Moss. Can't be mad at that. That's why you have Randy Moss on the field. That's why you pay him his 54, 60, 70 cap, whatever you pay him. That's why you have him in the field. So, and here we go with this. Oh, man, just show me this play art, please. Bro. What? Jesus himself isn't making this read. Who is making this read? What is there to read? Like, bro. I mean, sometimes when people make plays, man, you have to understand space and like what their play art possibly could be. Like, me, this play would be Jesus Christ. Like, <laughs> like, bro. Like, I. It's like. One, I, and I talk about this on offense a lot, man. I don't want to throw anywhere near the user. And what this screams to me is you're throwing somewhere near the user. When someone's playing zone, obviously, three through five, we all pretty much play zone. Let's just remove the fact that we play zone. 
What I like to do is have a flat route on both sides because when you have a flat route on both sides, it takes the flat zones all the way out the picture. Now you open up the coochie, which is the middle of the field. This route combination obviously is a flat route on the right, which is going to be kind of where he throws the ball because he opens up the coochie on the right side, but he has nothing open up the coochie on the left side. Plus, you also have to make people put flat routes on the field. You have to make them put hard flats. And when I call a play, third and two at the 13-yard line, I'm assuming you're going to have hard flats on the field. Everything's going to be shaded down. So right off the bat, Fournette is not an option, especially not in this formation. Because I, I know I respect my opponent enough to assume they're going to play hard flats. I assume they're going to take away Leonard Fournette. So where, like, I just don't understand where else you're throwing the ball. I mean, you have 60. Obviously, you want to throw the ball underneath, but because he's going, he's going to be shaded underneath, there's going to be yellow zones up your asshole when you call this play because it's third and two. And he's going to have Apke right here in the middle of the field lurking. Now, obviously, you'd be better off running inside zone in this situation. And what happens is, I don't know if he makes another high route. Oh, he, he changed this in route to a drag. Okay, so now we have an in route, a drag, a slant. <sighs> Lord Jesus. I just like... Oh, he motions this slant over, so the slant's going to flip. Okay, so this is the play we're going to run. And it works out. Now, like I said, flat flat rod is gone. This guy's gone. You're going to come down to throwing at Apke. He covers this slant. Now, both of these guys are open. Now, for some reason, this is just a shitty throw. This I, Obviously, it kind of worked. I'm uh, As much shit as I talked... <laughs> It kind of worked, and he got a shitty throw, a shitty catch. I don't know why he got such a shitty throw on a bad pass. So it kind of worked. But he could have hit the other one behind him and walked into the end zone. So it kind of worked. But now we have a fourth and two. Now we have a four-point game. You have eight minutes and 34 seconds left in the game. You're going to get the ball back probably at least twice. You're going to get the ball back. I believe he only gets the ball back once, though, because like we talked about Wesley, he's going to use the clock. Any great player is going to use the clock. He has Gurley. He's going to pound the ball a little bit. He's going to use the clock to his advantage, especially if he gets the ball back up four points or even up one point. But... If you're going to go for this, boy, you better have a good play. You better have the dot of a lifetime if you're going to go for this, honestly. And everybody hates kicking field goals. And I believe if CJ had that field goal back from the first half, if it's 10 to 9 right here, he might kick and go 12 to 10. Plenty of time left back in this ball game. And, and what you guys would do and what I would do, it's – it's up for debate. Once again, it's another fourth down. I'm not mad at it. He kicked the field goal earlier on fourth and three from way deeper when it would have been way easier to get the first down. But fourth and two, and he decides to go for it. Now, this is why I say if you're going to go for this, man, you better have the dot. Not a dot. The dot. Not two slant, not three drags and a table route. That can't be. We need something a little bit better. And we're going to go back. to This is the play. That he do the interception on in the first in the first half. So I I don't really I think he does something bad here. And when he got just got rid of his C route, we have a now we have a flat that's spreading out this side. This going to take this flat zone all the way to the sideline. We have no flat over here though. What I like if I'm putting a slant, Fournette on a swing or even Golden Tate. I mean you want to keep this post Golden Tate. Shout out to one of the best wide receivers in the NFL, Golden Tate, the Philadelphia Eagles. Shout out for I, I want honestly, Chad, I want to say that this Golden Tate is actually a 10 cap power up. I want to say that. I want to say that his players are tired and this Golden Tate is a power up. Because nobody has Golden Tate. <laughs> if you, there is no Golden Tate card that's worthy of being on the field, but I know he has a 10 cap power up. And also, let me tell you something. I used to be a 10-cap power-up guy because they're 10-cap, but there's like 86 speed wide receivers that are 10-cap that you need to have on your team. We're going to rewind to being prepared. As much credit as I've given CJ for being prepared, you cannot have a power-up wide receiver as your backup wide receiver. 
He's like, what, 70 speed? You can get you a nice 85, 84, 86 speed 10 cat wide receiver. Use Mutthead, do your research, get you a nice wide receiver that can come in for the backup situations and really get down. Yeah, that's why I use Whitney. So, anyway, so I will tell you this. If I come to the line of scrimmage, it's seven seconds. The clock, I'm, I'm hot route when I'm freestyling. Boom, I'm the quarterback. I look out to my right, and I have my power up wide receiver on pretty much – I don't want to say my money route, but an important route to my play. This is my power at wide receiver. I'm taking my delay game. I'm taking my three. I'm staying alive because we all obviously being down in Madden sucks, but the best the best point to be down is, is a one point deficit because no matter what happens, unless they decide to go for two, you're always going to be down one score, even if you give up a touchdown. So if I see if I see this Tate guy out here, I'm probably taking my delay game. Because obviously he sees Golden Tate. And what makes me realize that he sees Golden Tate is that he took the time, if you see this, he really took the time to go through his plays to really look at his depth chart. I oh, didn't see it, but I just saw it after that third down debacle. You see right here, he's really he sees he's doing that to try to give energy back to his players. You scroll through your plays, really like, all right, I need to give energy back to my players. So he sees this 10 cap. And that's why he's thinking, do I kick right here? No, he – he, you know, he put the big boy pants on. I'm going to go ahead and go for this. But he has – and now the clock's running, dude. And so when the clock's running on you and he runs a slant, a hitch, it just covers the hitch. There's really nowhere to go. And this is where I talk about having a flat route to spread this guy out. Pause. You come out here. Let's go back to the play art. Now, Joe Rice is going to have one of these guys on a flat route. Because there's nobody over here – that's why I say some people shouldn't freestyle. Because this post, honestly, like I said, he would have been better off putting Golden Tate on a smoke screen. Because it would have opened up a bigger hole. Bigger hole over here for him to hit this slant than this post right here. Because the post brings the zones back into the middle and it kind of causes him to get boxed. But obviously he wants to throw this hitch. And when I call a play, what I do is I say, what happens if they cover where I want to throw the ball? So I would have said, what happens if Joe Rice covers this hitch? I'm going to throw this slant. How's the best way for me to get this slant open? Because as much as we want to say we read the whole field, I don't read the whole field. I don't want to have to look at four wide receivers. I'm, I kind of want to go back and have two options, like a what-if option. Like what if he covers this? What if this happens? What if blah, blah, blah. Against a standard – now this is 3-3-5 three, three, odd. This is just a standard cover three. No, it's not standard, but my point is it's just cover three. So you're going to have a cloud. You're going to have a zone in the middle. You're going to have a deep zone. So it's going to be tough to hit Golden Tate over the top, even though he had it earlier in the game. So, and because this is Golden Tate, another reason, because this is power of Golden Tate, you're not throwing him this goddamn ball. You're not. Not for your, your Houston Club Series Live. So you're either throwing this hitch right over here to Moss or you're throwing a slant to Beckham because you're not throwing a wide side flat route for two yards on fourth and two. So pretty much when you come to the line, you have two options. And he didn't give Beckham the best chance to get open by not having a flat route over there. Because when you see when the play really develops, you see this guy right here. If there was a swing route or if Golden Tate power-up was on an out route, it would have took this flat zone further out. So he could have hit this slant in here. But what happens is you see this post will bring this guy back to the middle of the field. And you see a yellow zone. Right. I mean, it's just it's just the defense really bagged the play that he put on. You see how, how close this flat zone is to the middle of the field. This post brought him right back into covering here. So if he put him on an out route, this flat zone would have been all the way by the sideline, and he could have hit this slant over here by the S. Would have been a tough catch, but he definitely gave himself no opportunity to hit anything over here. Although he almost threw it over his head, God bless, but the deep zone came and got it. So he turned the ball over here. Bang. So now you're down four. You go down here, Joe Rice. Obviously, Joe, I honestly, as good as Joe Rice played the last game, he kind of got bagged. And one thing that this, whatchamacallit, defense gave him, and then uh, just a misstep right there by CJ, giving up a big play. But he eventually gets Joe Rice to a fourth down. And one thing that I see Joe Rice just using that clock, man, he's going to use the clock. I forget when he gets him to the fourth down. Here, the fourth and four. Is this it? Nah. It is fourth and four. Now this, I'm this is Wesley gonna be mad at me, but he's the first person I've seen to do this. Run the vertical scheme, but instead of this crossing route, he puts this guy on a hitch. 
So now he has the same two quick options, but then he also has the hitch. He throws underneath the girly, and now he gets him to. Nah, that's actually I believe in, in the last drive. So eventually he holds him to three though. That's what happens, and Wesley uses all the clock like he should because once again we're in a position where if Wesley gets a touchdown here, the game is over. So he and and it's been like that. Wesley got held to three a couple times on his drive. Let me see if we can get some. He's in his under center thing. He's just because he knows if I can score a touchdown, especially if I can score a touchdown and take some time off the clock, then the game's going to be over. So he already has 11 carries with Gurley. Third and three, I believe he goes to one of his little cute dots. Vic actually picks it up. So he, things are working out perfectly for him, although he's in the toughest spot in the game to score. Chewing the clock. He's really taking the whole game with him. And I believe what happens is I'm not going to – he gets a – he screen. The one thing CJ did is he brought the crib at that under center stuff. Like, he didn't have time to really make any reads because the one thing I did notice about Joe, he likes to send out five when he's under center when he does pass. So he really got screamed that, held him to three right here, and boom, there we go. With uh, He drops right there. So he kicks his field goal. He goes up seven. Now we talked about all the field goals that CJ left on the board. He left six points on the board already. Six, easily six points. So he could easily have 12 points. But that's neither here nor there. As a man player, you got a ball in your hand. Let's go get our let's go get our score. Let's go get our touchdown to tie this game up. And once again, we see the scum kick because he didn't want to get a ball to Deion Sanders again. This time, Frank O'Hare. What look at look at that. Frank O'Hare's spin move. Bang, we're at the 50-yard line. That's absurd. So it is my point. If you're going into the competitive man, a lot of you guys are playing club series right now. You need an effective player at the fullback position. Be prepared for these scum kicks because if you can do that, get the ball at the 50-yard line, it is absolutely devastating to your opponent. So boom. So and eventually he throws a dot here. Boom, big dot. He's in field goal range. Now, this is, I, this is something that now if I'm CJ, I'm thinking, damn, I, I got to tie this game up, but I can't let him back on the field. Cause, and I just talked about this in the last game with uh, Cassandra that when you're playing somebody, you're pretty much going to guarantee you're giving up a field goal. You got to respect your opponent enough to where I'm going to give up a field goal, especially if I leave him enough time. He already has three timeouts. I want to get into all those timeouts. I want to get inside the 10, and I want to score. So to me, and I'm probably every man player in the world, I, this is definitely going to the two-minute warning. This is the first thing I noticed watching this game live is this is going to two-minute warning nine, every time for me. Now what happens is he actually comes out here and runs a play, quick snaps, but he scores a touchdown. So it's hard to look back and say that this was a bad decision because he does score a touchdown. You know, he does tie the game up. The game's tied. But for me, I'm definitely taking it into two to the point where I come, when I come out, I'm pretty much guaranteed going to run two to take 30 seconds off the clock. And that's definitely going to go ahead and uh, – but he ties the game up. So you can't argue with a touchdown. It's hard to argue with a touchdown. I definitely wish he would have had one of those threes from earlier now. So he got to get one stop. There we see Joe Rice prepared for the scum kick. Takes it out of the 37. So now you got like – you're looking at it from the 37, you're looking at it, and they're 30, 40 yards, the game is over. Kiv, exactly. That's uh, You got to at least, even if it's the not not the last drive, you at least got to get to one minute. You got to get into those timeouts, man. As You're going to put more pressure on yourself because you're going to get to a point where you have to, you only have one play to score, you only, I mean, and so on and so forth, but you have to really use the time there. And what happens, uh, this is actually, I mean, he plays good defense, gets a sack from Sealer. Third and 14, uh, is this the – the one thing about the route, Kims, the best way to combat the, the block shed defense that I've seen from watching a lot of people play in the last couple of weeks is the play action. It's one of the reasons that Trips Titan is so good because their best plays are play action. So the best way, as you can see here, he but he runs play action and these guys get mauled. Because we see so many people in the black shed defense with their defensive ends. Their defensive ends are bad, but they're still getting a lot of pressure. And because they're because they're bad, if you run the play action, they don't get those animations and they get mauled. So, But the problem with bunch is, all the, I mean, Joe Rice wants to run a bunch. All the great offensive players want to run a bunch. But the play action, they got rid of PA post is so bad 
that is hard to run bunch play action. But with the route comes, now boom, he's running play action, and he has the he has Pat Sale pretty much out of play action. So you see how much time he has. Look at these guys just getting their ass beat. Third and 14, once again, CJ has the slowest Troy Apke I've ever seen. Those are Ramos. Stays in bounds. Huge deal staying in bounds right there. I want to give him the credit and said that he did that on purpose. But if he goes out of bounds, it gives CJ a chance to get the ball back. But because he stayed in bounds, it looked like he did it on purpose. Come back in. Stay in bounds right there. That's where if you're CJ, you want your, your defender to be smart enough to lift him and move him out of bounds. But because he stayed in bounds, me personally, I'm calling timeout right there. Because, I mean, I, I want, right now I'm, I lost pretty much is what I'm saying. I lost the game. Let me call my timeout. I need to find a way to get the ball back. <coughs> he doesn't call timeout, lets the clock run, and, and Joe does the right thing. He eventually gives the girl, he gets a first down. We all know we all know that um, icing the kicker is super broken. This is another thing I feel about icing the kicker. Okay, if I come out and kick, you call timeout. Now I don't come out and feel good. I run a spike, boom. You should still be iced. It's not like the kick. So pretty much you call ice on the kicker, right, to make the kicker think about the field goal even more, right, put more pressure on him. So <clears throat> in real life, if I'm the kicker, you you ice me, and my my offense decides to go run a little spike and then, then send it. And I'm still thinking about the field goal, right? So essentially you're making it worse. You're compounding the problem by running extra plays you know, after they already iced me. So I think if you ice the field goal kicker once, it doesn't matter what the offense does, your field goal kicker should still be iced. If that's going to be in the future in the game, it needs to be fixed it, because it it's just too easy to avoid, and you can't avoid it in real life. You know, the kicker's iced regardless in real life. So, I mean, if you want to keep this ice the kicker theme in Madden, it needs to be fixed to where if you're kicking a field goal, it needs to be iced in this situation like this no matter what, you know. Unless honestly, I would probably use my field goals because I know the the you know the dynamic of man is broken. I would use my timeouts to get the ball back. But if it was, if I didn't, if I knew it worked, I might save a timeout just to hope he misses the field goal. But did he throw a did, did he throw a spike? The spikes are wild, aren't they? Takes it all the way to one. I would have called my timeout and had a minute left. After he gets this, the game's over. Did he come out and spike? Spike does, like, bounce off people's face and stuff. Yeah, so, I, I honestly, but this is just, I, I think it's bad that, that this wor doesn't work. So, see, I would do this, too. You know, you, <laughs> you're going to use all the plays. I want a fluky, fluky spike to bounce up and, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, I would just take a knee right here. But after all that, after all that, somehow this kicker's not – He's he doesn't care anymore, number two. He doesn't care. Yeah, I might so what. So, congratulations to uh, Wesley, man. I, th I thought he really played well. I mean, I, it, obviously there's some things he'd like to do better. He's got plenty of time now, man. I know he's relaxed, probably been thinking about this Houston Club Series for a long time, and to get that weight off his chest, finally winning this, finally uh, doing a, a lot of what – he set off to do the first step of pretty much what he set off to do this year. And the biggest thing I have with it, I mean, and we talk about it, this, and I tweeted about it maybe a couple of days ago, is just the lack of the promotion for his accomplishment. I mean, we're talking about, I mean, Joe Rice, obviously one of the more talented players. And I talked about him being in the podcast, man. He's one of the more talented younger players that obviously we know in this our little tight Madden community, but – the rest of the man world needs to know about man, and I thought EA really did a shitty job of promoting this uh, this event. It really they didn't they didn't use the man Twitter at all. They didn't use the mutt Twitter at all. The Texans had one tweet like "Come watch it," and he really didn't get the same attention that other people get. And and that's something that I know. Like I said, this was something that he set out to do. It's a goal that's on his chalkboard at home next to his xbox and it's something that he accomplished and I, I wish they did a better job of promoting him and really giving him the acknowledgement that that he deserves for winning a club series now i see other people now the nfl teams are all different some of them really promote it some of them really shout out their players and really big up uh the man competitors that really um accomplished this and, and for him not to really get that 
really disappointed in me. It's like, how are we setting out to continue to grow the MCS and to continue to grow men as a eSport without the proper promotion of our players, of our stars, and turning somebody like Wesley, who is one of the best man players in the world, into a star or into somebody, somebody that people follow or people pay attention to or people acknowledge as one of the best man players in the world. And that's something I wish they did a better job of. And honestly, if it, if it continues like this, we're going to have to take the reins of that as because it's probably about almost 10 man players right now that have a bigger following than the Madden League Ops Twitter. So I think that there really needs to be some type of promotion of these players that really accomplish great things and players that really put their time and effort into this game of Madden. And I really wish it was a bigger deal for the rest of the world. I mean, if we're ever going to grow to something that this Madden wants to be, we really need their help in promoting us, you know, because that's what they can do for us. They can get all the eyes on, you know, the Wesleys, the Kivs, the Ghosts, the Jokes, all these guys that are great Madden players need more promotion, you know. And, and like I said, if it doesn't continue, if it continues the way it is, we're going to have to really do our best to promote. So make sure you follow Wesley. I don't know what uh, – let me see. I know I had tweeted about this earlier. About Wesley. Y'all don't want to see what my timeline looks like. It's bad. Because this was something that definitely uh, promote man better. Please follow Wesley G at Wesley G, the Texans Club Series champion with a Falcons – a Falcons background, but says Texans Clubs champion. I mean, we might have to do something about that, Wesley. But, uh, yeah, definitely follow at Wesley G, man. He definitely uh, deserves to put a lot of time and effort into this game. One of the better players in the world. He's going to continue to show that. It's going to be great seeing him compete against the other uh, AFC people, AFC South to start. So he's definitely going to get, get uh, going forward in that. All right, that's just the promotion. I wish it was better, man. It's been pretty shitty for the last two years now. And, uh... What's the last thing I want to get to? Let's get to the NFL. I mean, I know I spent a lot of time talking about <laughs> talking about those two games. They were interesting to me. And like I said, I can really talk about the way people play. And there was some bad things I saw and some good things I saw. But week nine happened. The Eagles did not play. They did not lose this week. They are 4-4. Four and four. And honestly, the way the division is rounding up, the Eagles will win the division fairly easily. Because, I mean, you see here, I mean, the Redskins came out here and laid down to the Falcons. The Falcons beat the – breaks off of the Redskins. I mean, a lot of people thought the Reds, and I thought the Redskins were doing pretty well week five, week seven, week eight, week nine. <clears throat> yeah, so the Redskins got clapped by the Falcons, actually allowed Julio Jones to score a touchdown. Julio Jones' first touchdown in like five calendar years. But um, so the Redskins are, I believe, five and three now. The Eagles are four and four. The other game in the, in the division is the Cowboys. The Cowboys got smoked last night by the Titans. So the Cowboys are 3-5. and five. They're cooked. Actually play the Eagles this week. It is Dallas week, so hopefully we smack on the Cowboys. I believe it's a Sunday night game. But, and that's how it went. The Panthers are strong. I believe the Panthers are 6-2 and two after the Eagles let them off the hook, man. The Panthers are doing really good. They beat the Buccaneers. I would think the Chargers, the Chargers, I believe, have a good record, too. The Chargers are rolling. The Chargers are always a team that starts slow. But then really pick it up as the season started. This year, the slow start wasn't six games. It wasn't eight games. They weren't three and five. They were, I think, only one and two. So the slow start was earlier. So right now it's looking like the Chargers, Chargers are looking at probably the main wild card spot because they do have the Chiefs in their division. But <clears throat> I would say the Chargers are one of the top teams in the AFC behind the Chiefs and the Patriots. I mean, and the Texans are definitely another team cooking with gas. I mean, you have the Chiefs, Texans, Chargers, Patriots, the Steelers won again. Will be interesting to see what happens with Le'Veon Bell if he comes back. As far as I'm concerned, Le'Veon Bell, you can stay where you're at. If I'm if I'm a Steelers fan, if I'm on the Steelers team, the way James Conner, James Conner is not Le'Veon Bell, but he's doing good enough. Running back is not that big a deal. They're not losing games. They're not a weaker team because they don't have Le'Veon Bell. And if you don't feel the need to come to the game, you don't feel the need to come and, and play with your teammates or play for our team, as far as I'm concerned, you can stay wherever you are. That, and that's just how I am. That's how I would be as an Eagles if I was a Steelers fan, if I was in a Steelers organization, because they're playing fine without them. The Ravens looked like a team that was going to be tough this year, and I feel like they lost three games in a row. 
So they're definitely gasping for air. So it's looking like the Steelers are going to win that division. Although the Bengals still have a decent record, I believe. Did the Bengals play or they were on bye this week? Looks like they were on bye with the Eagles. But, yeah, the Bengals are bad. The Steelers and Bengals are going to be duking it out for that. But the Chiefs, the Chargers, Texans, Patriots, that's pretty much what the AFC is looking like. NFC, and we're going to talk about this game, the Saints and the Rams, probably the two best teams, obviously the two best teams in the NFC. I want to say maybe the two best teams in the NFL. The Saints and the Rams, excellent game, probably the game of the week to watch, really entertaining. And then we saw the Patriots and the Packers, two of the top five quarterbacks of all time play, the Patriots. Patriots are, are rolling. They're always going to be there between the coach and the quarterback, even without Gronk. But um, the Rams and the Saints, man, this is the game I want to focus on. I'm on what would a man player do? And it's just a small tidbit, nothing crazy elaborate. It's just It just goes down kind of how we talked about possessions with between C.J. and Joe Rice and possessions. And man's a game of possessions because it's so much shorter. I mean, you want to maximize your possessions. Each possession you have, you want to use it to the best of your ability because in a man game, you might get four possessions. You might get five. In an NFL game, you might get ten possessions. You know, but it all comes down to the same thing, the same premise. Essentially, it's just that much bigger of a sample size. Like I said, man, you might have four or five possessions. In real football, you'll have ten possessions. So what I want to show you guys here is this is week nine. This is the Saints and the Rams. And what happens here is that, one, both of these teams are offensive powerhouses pretty much. Between Gurley running for the Rams and between my man Alvin Kamara, Drew Brees, who for some reason we talk about Rodgers and Brady, Drew Brees has to be in the top five conversation of all time at the quarterback position. And they were going back and forth. I mean, each offense went right down the field pretty much. And these teams, well, look, the Rams are 8-0, and the Saints are 6-1. and And what happens here is <clears throat> this is the sec- the third drive of the game for the-, for the Saints. You know, and we got the Rams here, boom. The Rams are supposed to have a great defense because they paid a lot of money for all their players. And they do have a good defense. But but in New Orleans, it's really hard to play against New Orleans. So this is the third drive of the game for the Saints, the fifth drive overall of the game, and this is the first play. And, Melvin, and uh, what's his name? Mark Ingram fumbles. Aaron Donald picks it up. Boom. So you get the fluky turnover. Now, I'm mad. If you're playing the Saints or the Rams, that's the equivalent of playing the Skimbo, the Kiv, the Ghost, the great offensive player. Because they both of these offenses went right down the field. So if you're playing these guys, you have to assume that, man, they're going to keep scoring, you know. But right there, by me getting a turnover, I just got a possession. I just gained a possession on them. So, boom, what happens is Ingram fumbles, the Rams get the ball. So the Rams get the ball in field goal range already, and they're going to line up for a field goal. But instead of taking the field goal, they're going to go ahead and run a fake. Boom. Johnny Hecker, who I met at the Pro Bowl, signed my Pro Bowl football. Johnny Hecker, best punter in the history of punters because I met him. But anyway, he runs here. Now, I will tell you this. I felt the Rams got cheated on this call. I thought he had the first down. I thought he definitely had the first down. You know what I mean? I thought he reached over the line. thought he reached the ball before he went down. Boom. But they challenged it. did not get overturned. I thought he was past the line. I don't know about you guys, but I thought he was past the line for sure. But th- what this goes back to is that they risked by calling this fake field goal and giving the punter the ball to run. <laughs> to run. Uh, Sean McVay risked losing that possession advantage. When he got the fumble, he risked losing the possession. And as a Madden player, I'll tell you this right now, is that if I got that possession, if we're going back and forth like the Saints and the Rams were, and all of a sudden you fumble and I have the ball back, I'm going to go ahead and take my field goal and get my possession and gain my lead, gain kind of flip in the possession battle that football and Madden is, especially when you have two high-powered offenses, man. It's definitely was something that I would have kicked the field goal just because you got to make them pay for turning the ball over. And taking your field goal there is some, some way to make them pay for turning the ball over. And because they didn't get it, whether you agree with the challenge or not, agree with the spot or not, they did not get it, so they turned the ball right back over to the Saints. And you're right where you're at before he fumbled. You didn't make them pay at all for turning the ball over. And as far as I'm concerned, I definitely would have made them pay and took my field goal there. But that's just cool because then you'll fast forward all the way down here or we'll watch an ad, one or the other. I mean, make sure you guys check out the new Casper Wave mattress. 
But being so, my point is that they came back to want those three points in the end. That's pretty much uh, what I I say all that to say they wish they had those three points. <clears throat> As you see, they're kicking the three points here. They wish they had those three points when it was 35 to 35, you know. Because what happens is the Saints go down here and kick a field goal. Boy, oh, boy, those three points would look really damn good on the Rams board right now. <clears throat> but, you know, that's why they're in the NFL, and I'm sitting here behind the desk at the Needed Podcast. This was episode five. We talked about the Houston Club Series. I believe this week, check me if I'm wrong, I believe this week the Steelers Club Series is going live. Well, regardless, I'm going to have more stuff to talk about. Next week, we're definitely going to talk about all the online elimination. I saw amazing games last night. I saw 49er literally throw the ball up in traffic the entire game. It was an amazing watch. So we're definitely going to talk about a bunch of things next week between online elimination and another club series. I'm definitely excited to talk about that. So if you're playing in live events, Make sure you play well because I will air you out. All the shitty stuff you do, I see it all. But I appreciate you guys checking it out, whether you're in the Twitch chat, whether you're in the YouTube, wherever you are. Really appreciate it. Make sure you hit the links below to watch my games live. Check out all the ebooks. Get yourself a We Are Madden hoodie. It is hoodie season. It is cold out. Make sure you guys cop up. Also, like I said, I appreciate you guys coming through. This was episode five.